Last session, I cited that Trinata is a continuity and not one or two pivotal acts or events, or an evolutionary rather than a revolutionary state. I believe there is general agreement here. But when I said Canada was the first state since 1600 to emerge without revolution or civil war, I hear voices asking, hey, what about the Battle of the Plains of Abraham and French-British struggles that led up to it? The rebellions of 1837 and uprisings Louis Riel led in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. How do we view these if not as revolutionary acts? If you know enough of our history to answer these challenges, or have an aversion to military history, you may wish to skip to Kanata Trait 4. But if they cause you uncertainty, what is called a reasonable doubt for a jury, you may decide not to. In the next couple of sessions, I'll deal with these objections to see if they stand as objections or even overturn the evolutionary trait. By being willing to examine opposing arguments, we can be more confident that in peaceful evolution we're not imbibing doctrines such as manifest destiny or the glorious fatherland that have been rightly discredited. The examples I listed are not of equal impact, but that doesn't mean they're unimportant. Campart, the French what does it matter, is about significance. Small events can have big impact. The fall of the Bastille is an example. Louis XVI wrote rien, nothing, in his diary for July 14, 1789, and look at what that cost him. Before looking at these events to see if they nullify our point, let's review the three revolutions we missed by chance as much as by choice, because missing them shaped us. We missed the English Revolution that beheaded its king 140 years before France, because apart from a fishing station in Newfoundland and attempts to find a passage through the Arctic, England didn't have interests here. What's now eastern Canada was a French claim that included the Mississippi. By the time New France passed to Britain, that now included Scotland, the monarchy was back in revolutionary extremism 100 years in the past. A king reigned, parliament ruled, and as the north half of British North America moved toward self-government 100 years later, we had the advantage of parliamentary democracy without the bloodshed it had cost the British to win it. The Scottish-French connection worked in favour of rights for the St. Lawrence French in the Quebec Act, and Quebec remained neutral when the 13 colonies rebelled. Its chances of remaining a distinct society looked better under a distant king than in joining the people to the south in a Protestant-led movement in which their Catholic heritage could be assimilated. Britain's takeover and France's choice at the conference table of Caribbean sugar ahead of its St. Lawrence colony that was frozen a third of the year occurred 26 years before the French Revolution. This realignment spared us the terror and the guillotine, committees of public safety, and a national anthem ending in a call to arms lest impure blood overrun our gutters. The vast majority of Quebecois were appalled at the excesses of the French Revolution and its overturning the traditional values on which New France had been built. They now realized that they were on their own in the New World and this sense of abandonment by the colonial parent persisted until the 1967 visit to Quebec by French President Charles de Gaulle. Having seen how we escaped the upheaval of three major revolutions by our European colonial parents and North American neighbour in 150 years, we can now look at battles, uprisings and lesser incidents on our home soil. There were three waves of this unrest. First, the French-English struggles on the East Coast, Atlantic and Hudson Bay, culminating in the transfer of colonial administration French Canadians called the Conquest. Secondly, the struggles for self-government by French and English-speaking settlers under British administration. And third, post-Confederation expansion upheavals on the Western Plains and incidents elsewhere. The English-French skirmishes on the east of Turtle Island were part of a struggle for global supremacy. This included five nations' hostility to New France that began when Champlain armed their Huron enemies. The hero stories, Les plus brillants exploits, in the French words of O Canada, 
refer to resistance against raids by Five Nations war parties funded and armed by Britain out of New Amsterdam, later New York. During this time, English privateers from Newfoundland twice took over Quebec and both times withdrew and returned it to French control afterwards. To end this intermittent back and forth, Britain, under William Pitt the Elder, namesake of Pittsburgh, entered the Seven Years' War. This was also called the French and Indian War, because of British resolve to expel the French from North America and save the cost and pain of defending their 13 colonies from attacks from New France down the Richelieu River, across the Great Lakes, and eastward from French forts along the Mississippi River. The Québécois believed that what had happened before would repeat after the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, and that the British would leave after counting their money at the table. The victorious British felt the same and left the people whose lands they occupied largely alone for four years. When France chose Guadeloupe over Quebec at the peace conference, the first British military governor, James Murray, a Scot, wrote very favorably to George III, saying, Your Majesty has no finer subjects anywhere, urging their religion and culture be left undisturbed. Many later English-speaking Canadians, up to my parents' generation, believe Britain should have completed the conquest and assimilated the French population. The terms of the Quebec Act were unusually generous. Britain had reasons for the policy. Quebec's religious leaders likewise. The Catholic Church had greater influence under British rule than it had had in New France. Protests, uprisings or rebellions in Nova Scotia, Upper and Lower Canada in the 1830s were led by journalists in all three areas. Their goal was a greater measure of self-determination when governors and their advisors ran colonies like principals and teachers used to run schools, using elected student councils as forums to pass decisions down rather than discuss and debate them. There are three reasons for not calling these revolutionary. First, they did not remake or turn around their societies, what revolution, as distinct from rebellion, means. Their goal, greater home rule or responsible government, came about gradually, through evolution. Second, in the two provinces where there was a resort to arms, it did not succeed. The rebels fled to the United States or were subdued by British troops aided by homegrown militias. In Upper Canada, the uprising was over in a few days. In Quebec, uprisings continued into 1838. In Nova Scotia, where responsible government was first achieved, it came about without a shot being fired, after the acquittal of reformer Joseph Howe by a jury. Third, when the insurgencies were over in Quebec, reprisals were lenient. Though troops had executed some of the leaders they had defeated, a new governor-general, Lord Durham, sent out by Britain to look into the causes of the unrest, banished the remaining ringleaders to Bermuda, and his successor, Lord Elgin, signed into law the Rebellion Losses Bill passed by a newly empowered assembly to compensate damages on both sides of the dispute. Elgin's 1846 signature, simply because the bill had been voted by the assembly, established responsible government in the Canadas and began the path to confederation 21 years later. It's fair to say that Canada emerged without revolution or civil war. Confederation's expansion into the West was more complex. We'll look at this separately in another episode where we meet the complex character of Métis leader Louis Riel and his interaction with the complex, ambivalent character of Sir John A. Macdonald. For Canada Connections, I'm David Watts. <laughs>